So from time to time, we uh, like to invite members of our CBI community uh, to be the guest uh, darshan, the guest uh, speaker or preacher uh, on Friday night. It's a pleasure to invite Kale Clark uh, to come on up to the BMAC. Kale is the uh, friendly and welcoming face that you see at the reception desk when you uh, come into the building. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you up here, Kale. Shabbat shalom. All right. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Kale Clark, and I am the assistant to the executive director here at Congregation Beth Israel. It is quite an honor to get up here and speak in front of all of you this evening. A warm welcome to our friends from First United Methodist Church Round Rock. Thank you for joining us. And as well as to the family and friends of our bar mitzvah, Jacob Stuxbury. Mazel tov, Jacob. I would also like to thank my sister, Natalie, for coming tonight and supporting me. You're lucky that I'm your brother. <laughs> and uh, also to my good friend, Kristen Danaher, for showing up and supporting me tonight, and for my coworkers who've stayed late to listen to me speak. So before I dive into our focus for tonight, I would like to share with you all that this particular era of Shabbat marks my one year uh, since my first CBI service. Uh, a few lines from my journal entry that evening read as follows. I was a little uncomfortable initially. I wanted to keep to myself and sit in the back. I didn't really want to put myself in the situation to have much conversation with folks. I just wanted to blend in. Now, I'm not sure which is funnier, the fact that a year later I am standing in front of the entire congregation on the bima, uh, or the fact that I thought I could blend in. I mean, let's be honest, there's only so many people who could speak on behalf of Black History Month tonight. So, and thank you to Sarah Jew uh, for wanting to make sure that I wasn't being tokenized. Um, <laughs> thank you, Rabbi. Uh, <laughs> actually, when Rabbi Levy first approached me to share on behalf of Black History Month, my initial reaction was, I'm not qualified. Now, looking at me, it may or may not be apparent that I am, in fact, a part of Black History. I've been asked if I'm Persian, Puerto Rican, Italian, Israeli, a wider categorization of Middle Eastern, and a few other interesting nationalities that I don't quite remember the names of. First of all, what this tells me is that I should travel the world because I would fit in a lot of places. <laughs> and second, it tells me that I better get moving because uh, if I want to be bi multilingual, that's going to take some time. So to answer the great mystery, I am a multiracial individual who has self-identified as biracial the majority of his life. On my mother's side, I have Irish, German, Scottish, and English heritage. And on my father's side reside my African-American and Cherokee roots. So if I have African ancestry, why did I qu question whether or not I was qualified to speak on behalf of Black History Month? Well, identity is a funny thing. I grew up in the camp of not white enough, not black enough which any human of multiracial, biracial, bisexual, non-binary, multi-faith, or any other blended or intersectional experience is likely to understand or can relate to. The not enoughness in regards to one identity or the other, the not quite fitting in to one category or the other. A mixed identity, an uncertain identity. Many here can relate to that in their own ways. For me, black never felt quite right, and white was never an option. On top of that, I didn't really fit in with the black kids, and some white friends shared that they just thought of me as white. In my youth, I found my racial belonging amongst other biracial kids. We all had white moms with black dads. In college, as a mixed race person, I found racial belonging in Fusion, the group for, my, for biracial, multiracial, and transracial adoptees. For those who aren't familiar with that language, a transracial adoptee is someone who's adopted by someone of a different race. Despite finding racial belonging in college, I still struggled with the words when it came to color well after college and into my 20s. You see, when I was a child, my mom told me that I was brown. I was black and I was white. I was both. I was biracial. While I fully embrace and love being brown today, as a child, I thought, who wants to be brown? I mean, really, whose favorite color is brown? <laughs> like, it's the color of poop and dirt. 
So, not great as a kid who just wants to fit in and feel good about themselves. If I had to say a color, I preferred tan because it seemed more attractive at the time. Ultimately, I most often said biracial. That was my identity, and that was the answer to everything, even when it was clear that it was a color-specific question. It took the, up, the racial upheaval of 2020 to propel me deep enough into my racial healing journey that I finally began to embrace the gift that my mother tried to give me as a child. I embraced being brown. I finally felt seen with that word, and it felt good. I was proud to be brown, and all of me was included. No part left behind, not even my Cherokee part, especially not my Cherokee part. Brown was the answer to an otherwise very uncomfortable identity crisis, and it was a great thing. My friend Melissa Okamura summed it up beautifully in her poem to her two biracial boys of Japanese and European descent. She tells them that they are not half white and half Japanese, but they are fully white and fully Japanese. They are not 50-50, they are 100-100. They are not half. They are whole. I don't know about you, but that healed something inside of me. So, Kale, what does this have to do with Torah? What a great question. You all thought you were escaping it, but no Jew escapes Torah. So, now that I, I know that a vast majority of you have read this week's Parsha, so for those very few of you have, who have not yet read it, uh, I asked G ChatGPT to provide a summary. For those who don't know, ChatGPT is artificial intelligence, and because despite the fact that I did read this week's Parsha, I will never come up with as good of a summary as ChatGPT. <laughs> you laugh because you know. So here we go. Exodus, or Shemot 25.1 through 27.19, covers God's instructions to Moses regarding the construction of the tabernacle, a portable sanctuary where God would dwell among the Israelites during their journey through the wilderness. The details include the materials needed, the design of the Ark of the Covenant, the construction of the tabernacle itself, the furnishings such as the altar, the lampshade, and the altar of incense, as well as instructions for the priestly garments and consecration rituals. These chapters emphasize the importance and precise craftsmanship and adherence to God's instruction in creating a sacred space for worship and divine presence. Woof. Now, Jacob. It occurs to me that we did not coordinate our drashot, our sermons. So I am hoping that I am not stepping on your Torah teaching toes, and I hope to merely pave the way for the far greater drash tomorrow morning coming from our bar mitzvah. No pressure. <laughs> so what we see in this week's Parsha is God's intentionality and purpose with design. We see God taking the finest of materials to create a space not only for worship, but to dwell in. This is not about a vacation place or a hotel. Despite its temporary structure, it was to be treated like a home, a dwelling place, made with materials deemed worthy of permanence. How much more important must the inside be if the outside is treated with such care and precision, built with such exquisite material? The outside, only to house the inside. What houses Torah is not greater nor more precious than Torah itself, and yet it is made with fine silvers and golds. We discover that's what's, that what's on the outside pales in comparison to what's on the inside, and still there is meticulous design. So while I am very happy with my brown skin, and while, and while I know that my brown skin is so deeply loved by God, I know that my heart and my mind and the essence of who I am are infinitely more valuable. It is not just with my body, my hands and my feet that I worship God, but it is with my heart, my mind, and my voice. It is with loving action, the thoughts that I think, and the words that I say. All of this irrespective of my DNA. And in the same breath, I want to share yet another perspective because it would not be very Jewish of me if I, if I did not offer more than one thought. <laughs> My friend Yulia once shared with me that she believed God created us the way we look for a specific reason. 
that somehow our purpose was tied to our physicality, to our physical appearance, who we would connect with, the lives we would touch, what God might want to share or reveal through us, what point God might be trying to make. It is in fact a Jewish perspective that offers the notion that our soul and our bodies are one. Not that our body is somehow contained within the soul, nor that the soul is somehow contained within the body. Rather, that our body is the essence or physical manifestation of our soul. And to that degree, the Jewish soul knows no bounds nor limitation. It will come into this world as whatever body it wants to in order to serve God's purpose. If I did not have the DNA that I have, I would not be standing up here in front of you sharing this drosh tonight. Had I known in the third grade that my dream of speaking in front of a congregation would one day be realized because of the color of my skin, I may have embraced being brown 25 years ago. And because my DNA has afforded me the privilege to stand up in front of you tonight, it is my responsibility to address an issue that seems to consistently arise within the Jewish family. You see, there's this really strange thing that happens for Jews of color where, for some reason, many people have a hard time seeing Jews of color as Jewish, which always intrigues me considering where Jews originate from. Many assume that Jews of color must be converts. Sometimes this is true. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes one or both parents are Jewish. Sometimes neither parent is Jewish. This is also true for white Jews or Jews of European descent. Some are converts, some are not. Some have both parents as Jewish or one parent is Jewish. For some, neither parent is Jewish. Either way, a Jew is a Jew is a Jew. And every Jew has a Jewish soul. Rather, every Jew is a Jewish soul. But what happens is we base our norms off of the experience and environment that we grew up in. That becomes the norm, the default. It makes perfect sense. It's just not indicative of reality. It is far from the whole story of the entire Jewish family. And what's harmful is assuming that your norm is the norm. What's harmful is othering someone simply because they're different according to you. If there's one thing I would ask of each person in this room and those watching over the live stream, it's that the next time you see a Jew of color, you think twice before asking them what they're doing here, or what their story is, or whether or not they're a convert. And let me be clear, there is absolutely nothing wrong with being a convert. In fact, the Talmud has incredible things to say about converts, if I do say so myself, and I do. <laughs> but my point is to discourage making assumptions and subjecting people to invasive inquiry. Any time we make an assumption about another human being, we run the risk of denying the truth of the human in front of us. I urge you to reconsider asking a Jew of color any question that you would not ask a white Jew. Because at the end of the day, a Jew is a Jew is a Jew. And every Jew is a Jewish soul. Therefore, I strongly encourage you to first get to know the person in front of you, honestly and sincerely, before subjecting them to a line of questioning. You'll learn their story in time if you are, in fact, sincere in your friendship, and after you've earned the right to hear what they hold is sacred. Make a friend. Care more about the friendship, more about the human being in front of you, than your curiosity of ancestry and origin, or in some cases, sexuality and gender. See the person, the whole person, beyond the body. Feel the heart, hear the soul, touch the spirit, because we create and destroy sanctuary among us. We create harm and fear and hate among us. We create safety and love and acceptance among us. And it is only among us that we can live into Shemot 25.8 and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living
Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Beautiful, Kale. Just